here. Come on, aren't we grateful to be in the house of the Lord? My name is Kristen Wilkerson, and it is um, such a privilege to speak to you today. And we have been in a series all about our values, our values as a church. And we get the opportunity to share about this probably every couple of years because we want you to know what we believe here at Trinity. And so Pastor Taylor, he really shared a great word last week about how Jesus is our message. This is all about the values of our house. See, every house has values. You know how some houses, you take your shoes off when you walk in? Values, right? Some houses are rowdy and crazy. It's, it's values. Values are either set up by default or design. And today, as a church, we want to make sure that we're not just letting things fall into place the way they might go, but we're going to lean into the design that God has for this house. Amen? See, our mission is what we do. Our mission is what we do, but our values are who we aim to be, who we aim to be. And today... Uh, Let me share with you just the seven values, just so you can get them in your heart. We're going to say them together, all of us, and we're going to start right at the top. So go ahead and put them on the screen. Let's say it together. Ready? Jesus is our message. People are our heart. Generosity is our privilege. Excellence is our spirit. Servant leadership is our identity. Honor is our calling and passion is our pursuit. Come on, give God some praise. We can read, it's awesome, proud of you. Today I'm gonna share with you a message titled Heart Work, Heart Work. We say here it's that people are our heart. And what that means for me and for you is that our heart is for all people. Somebody say all people. All people. Yes, even you. It's true. We believe that people are our heart because we love people because God loves people. God loved people so much that he gave his one and only son for you and for me. So people are our heart. But what is the function of a heart? When you really think about it, what does the heart in our bodies do? Well, the function of the heart is obviously to pump blood and oxygen all throughout your body so you can move, so you can live, so you can breathe. It has quite an essential function, the heart, right? How many of you know that we can't survive without our heart? And so when we say here at Trinity that people are our heart, we're saying people are essential. People are essential to God's plan. Here's the truth. God didn't have to use you and me. He didn't have to, but he created people so he could know us, have relationship with us, but that he could accomplish his purpose through us. For all of the things that God has done, he's done it through people, often in his plan. And what we've found is that without people, there really is no body. Without having a heart, your body can't function in the same way the church can't function without people. But come on, have you ever felt though, let's just be honest, like loving people is hard work? Anyone? Yes, loving people is hard work. Let's be honest today. Uh, We're sitting in church. I know it doesn't look like a church, might not feel like a church. Uh, Maybe when you walked in, you were surprised that this was a church. But all of us, at some point or another, whether you grew up in church or you've had family who's attended church, we've been familiar with this term, church hurt. The church has been a place where people have gotten hurt before. And I think that we all come to the table with our experiences today. I don't know what your experience was. Maybe you felt like you were misunderstood. Maybe you felt left out, isolated. Maybe you've really been wounded by people before. 
I've got to tell you that even as pastors, and as a pastor's kid growing up, unfortunately, I wasn't exempt from church hurt myself. There had been moments in my walk with Jesus and attending church and being a part of the body of Christ where I felt like I was mischaracterized, where I felt like the expectations, especially as a kid, on me to act a certain way were just a bar set too high for me to achieve. I felt before maybe even used. Now, I speak to this to speak to the reality that being a part of community is hard work. It's hard work. It takes getting up again and again, even when you've been hurt and saying, okay, I'm going to give it another shot. I'm going to give it another try. I'm not going to give up on people. There have been times in my journey as a pastor where I've said to God, God, this whole church thing would be a lot easier if there were no people. <laughs> you know what else would be easier? Parenting with no kids. <laughs> How many of you know that marriage would be a lot easier without a spouse? <laughs> but that wouldn't be marriage, and that wouldn't be parenting, and that wouldn't be the church. People are essential to what God wants to do through his church. He works through his people, his people. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said that the church is the church only when it exists for others. I don't know what you've heard about the church, but you see, we're a church who exists for others. We exist for each and every person in this room right now, but we exist not just that it would be us sitting here today, but that those who are far off from God would be able to come in and encounter His love. We exist for people to come and encounter the presence of God. We exist for people. It's the purpose, it's the function of the church. Ephesians 4, 16 says this, from him, the whole body joined together and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Somebody say, do the work. Do the work. What I found is that it's not just hard work to love people, it's heart work. It's not just hard work, it's heart work. And that's typically how it goes with God anyway. God, he's not just looking for us to build for him and to do the right things for him and to make sure that we're perfect for him. No, he's more concerned with our heart. When I reflect on scripture time and time again, we see that God, he's captivated by the hearts of people. We find that in 1 Samuel, when they're looking for a new king, they go to David's family and David's brothers stand before the prophet and one by one, God says, I haven't anointed him. I haven't anointed him. And they find that there was another brother out in the field tending to the flock. And he says, the prophet basically thinks, well, God, how, how could it not be these eligible people? But the scripture tells us that God, he doesn't look at the outward ex appearance the way that we do. He looks at the heart. I was talking to my kids this week and I said, what does it mean that we love, we're people who love God and love people? And one of the kids say, well, it's just how we are. It's just, just who we are. I was like, how would you know if someone was a Christian? And one of them said, well, maybe it's the way that they look. And, and I thought that that was a fascinating thing to hear from my child. The way that they look, what does that mean? And we started to talk more about it and it, it wasn't something that I said, oh no, that's not it. I wanted to go on a discovery with my children. Hey, we, we all do this. We all make judgments based on how people look and how we interact with others. 
the way that someone responds to us. Maybe it wasn't loving, maybe it wasn't Christ-like, but we don't know their individual experience with God. We don't know where they stand in relationship with Him. We're not just gonna look on the outward appearance. We're gonna say, no, God, you know the heart. You see the heart. And aren't you grateful today that God, He doesn't judge you by your mistakes, by your past, by your family, but He sees your heart and extends His forgiveness to you anyway? I think that's one of the most powerful things about the gospel, that God knows every thought in our head and every sin we've ever committed. He knows us fully and still loves us. He looks at our heart. He gives each and every one of us an opportunity to come into relationship with him. And we've got to understand today that as a church, if people are our heart, we're going to create an environment where everyone belongs. Everyone belongs. We're going to do the heart work that it requires. See, part of what we practice here is that we're going to see, value, and believe in people. If people are our heart, we're going to see, value, and believe in people. Yesterday, uh, a group of us went to Playland upstate. Have you ever been to Playland before? Okay, it is the most quaint, cute little theme park I've ever been to in my life. I said it last service and I don't know if it makes sense, but I was like, it's like the state fair meet, meets like a four star hotel. Yeah. It's like nice, but it's a fair, you know? Like you can still get all of that good fried food. And um, you ever go to somewhere nice and you're like, but can I please just get some chicken tenders? Yeah. Like, I'm so happy you have steaks, but I need some tenders. Um, but Playland, it was so special. Uh, we, we had some plans scheduled that got canceled last minute. And so it turned out that like 30 people from our church who are a part of our team all went up to this theme park together. And so Taylor just called me. He's like, where are you going? We're just going to tag along. So it was 36 of us walking around this park together, going on rides, Ooh. eating fried food. It was the best. And you know, I had um, all four kids with me, and so, uh, but I was just loving that we could just walk around and we had this big group with us, and I could just not worry about my kids because I knew someone was watching them. <laughs> someone, somewhere. And you know, they move so fast, and so you've just gotta trust your community, right? You, you see, here in the city, there's times when you can get lost in the crowd. And how many of you know that I wouldn't feel the same way if one of my kids was running around the city? I wouldn't just think, oh, people are watching out for them. No, it's different when it's your own crowd that your kids get lost in. <laughs> but you see, sometimes I think that that is one of the things that hurts us the most, is that we came out of the crowd and we encountered Jesus, and we walked into the church, and we got lost in the crowd that was supposed to be the one to accept us, to love us, to know us. The truth is, is we had expectations for what we walked into. And sometimes things don't live up to the expectation, do they? We can get disappointed with our experience, disappointed with people around us. Sometimes being lost in your own crowd can feel even more lonely and isolating than before. But I wanna show you something in scripture. You see, Jesus, he was well acquainted with a crowd. He could gather a crowd. He was comfortable with 10,000 people or more sitting on the lawn, listening to him teach all day. He was comfortable when it was a crowd of 12. He would get into their hearts, their lives. But I think it's fascinating that we see Jesus and when he encounters people on his way, it's always a unique interaction. We find that most of the time, everywhere Jesus was going, there were people crowding in on him. 
crowding in on him, sometimes even bumping into him, possibly. And I think about Mark chapter 10 and the story of blind Bartimaeus. And Jesus, he doesn't see blind Bartimaeus, but he hears him. And everyone else in Bartimaeus' life kind of ignored him at this point. Oh, he's, he, he just wants something from us. Oh, don't, don't worry about him. Even the disciples, when Jesus says, go and get him, they're like, why? Why would you waste your time? You've got important business. But Jesus hears his cry and he brings him to him and he says, tell me what it is that you want. And he encounters this blind man and he, he gives him sight again. I think this is fascinating to take note that Jesus didn't always need to see them, but they grabbed his attention anyway. When we talk about being a community where we see people, I want you to know it doesn't mean that everyone is going to know you and know your face and know your name. But it is that if there is a moment where you cry out and you need someone, people in this room will hear you. You'll have our attention. We'll come close to you. And what's even more than that is our cry to you is get in community. Be a part of a group. So that way there is People, there are people who know you deeply, who know your family, who know the struggles you're going through. It would be impossible for all of us to know everyone's story and everyone's name as we come and we go. And some of us travel, some watch online. We even have people down in the East Village that maybe you'll never meet. Who knows, right? But we've got to say, God, I want to be planted in community because I want, Lord, for you to use me so I I can see people in the journey that they're on. Not only that, but in Luke chapter eight, Jesus is on his way and he's, Jesus always is on mission. Okay, Jesus is always on mission. He's never lazy or lollygagging. Well, I've always wanted to use that in a sermon. Right, he's, he's, he's got a place to be. And people are trying to get something from him, but all of a sudden, he, he feels that someone has touched him. And the woman with the issue of blood, she was lost in her own crowd. Just like blind Bartimaeus, lost in their own community. Oh, they're just, they've just got an issue. They were on the sidelines, but she found a way to Jesus and he, gave her his attention and he healed her in a moment. Now what we don't see here is Jesus going one by one to every person in the crowd and asking them, what do you need? How can I help you? No, we don't see Jesus displaying that kind of behavior. We see him taking a moment for the one. I think it's a beautiful and realistic picture of what the church can be. If all of us could not just think, oh, because it's too great of a burden for most of us to bear, to think that the weight of the whole church is on our shoulders. I want you to know today that that's not my role either. That's not Pastor Taylor's role either, that we would be able to be there for every single person. It would be impossible. What our role is, is to raise up a church and a community that cares for each other, that says, we've got family here. I know who to call when I'm in a hard time. This isn't all dependent on one person. This is dependent on me. This is dependent on you. If all of us collectively say together, we're gonna look for the one, we're gonna reach out to those who need God, we're gonna be there for people who are struggling, then we'll have a church well taken care of. People are our heart. It means taking time for the one, seeing those who've been sidelined. Jesus, he always took time for the left out, the forgotten, the broken, the sick. And if that's you today, I want you to know that he sees you. He sees you. Now listen, this isn't a permission slip for us today to go, well, what about me? I'm the one. And we're, we're really talking values and, 
and house culture here because this is our home. I want, I want you to know that this isn't an excuse for you to go, well, well I'm, I'm the one that no one cares about here, so someone better notice me. That's not the culture of this house. The culture of this house is that I'm responsible for caring for the one. So if you're feeling that way, if you're feeling isolated, you're alone, then why don't you look around because I guarantee you, you'll find someone who feels something similar and they're looking for someone like you to step outside of their comfort zone and say, hey, I wanna know you, I see you. Let me bring value to you because every week someone walks into this room who've never encountered the love of Jesus. And if we are so focused on ourselves, we will never be able to reach the city God has called us to. The heart work for you and I today is this then. We've got to believe the best about people. I am so tired of the church collectively believing the worst about others. It's different. It's not the same. We're talking about the church. We're talking about God's people. Those who know God, love God, have surrendered their life to God. I'm, I'm talking to you right now. We are not people who are so offended that we can't actually believe that maybe someone has a lot going on in their life and they weren't able to take that moment with you. Sometimes we can be honestly so selfish to think and to mischaracterize someone else and say, oh, well, they're just too busy for me. Oh, well, they don't care about me. That's the third time they've said, nice to meet you. And by the way, if you need a hint, tell everyone it's nice to see you. You don't meet anyone anymore. You just see people, okay? It's nice to see you. It's part of my value. I see people. I want to bring value to people, but the, the idea that it's all on someone else is just not the body of Christ. The body of Christ says, I've got a role. I've got a function. It's on me to pump the blood of Jesus through every part of the body so that we can walk and live out the mission that God has designed for us. Come on, somebody. Aren't you grateful that Jesus gives us purpose? It's our role. We're, we're gonna believe the best. Hey, maybe that person, they, they just weren't able to be there for me in that moment. I'm gonna reach out to someone else. You have no idea what people are going through behind the scenes. Not only that, but we're gonna have a culture of authenticity. I think this is really powerful and important and I wanna give us all, just I wanna let us all off the hook today. If you don't know someone's name, you can ask them their name again. <laughs> There's nothing like this in church. I mean, it's bad, right? Where it's like, you've, you feel like you've gone too deep and you're like, I can't ask now. It's been a whole year. <laughs> been in their connect group, still don't know their name. <laughs> Anyone else? Tell me if that's you. So we can see hands, okay. Look around now, everyone feels the same way you do. You're not alone, okay? But a culture of authenticity says, I'm not gonna be offended because someone needs to be reminded. I'm not gonna be, that's a preaching moment right there. I'm not gonna be offended because someone needs to be reminded right? We all need reminding, not just about people's names, but about how God has called us to live. I need some reminding. I'm not going to be offended that someone comes into church smelling like smoke because they need to be reminded that they're still free. I'm not going to be offended because people are still struggling on the weekends, but show up hungover because they're still needing to get free. I'm not going to be offended because people need to be reminded that we serve a God who still heals, who still restores, who still breaks chains, who still sets the captive free. We're going to get comfortable with being reminded. Yes. And maybe today is your day that you can say, hey, remind me your name. Or perhaps we could go the other way and we could just say, hey, in case you forgot, my name is... 
Can we do that today when we go out to the lobby and we go out on the sidewalk? Come on, somebody. People love you. People love you. They love getting to talk with you on Sundays. They don't want to hurt you. I promise you, if you start to believe the best about people, you'll, you'll live a different life. They love, people love me. My church loves me. My church cares for me. My church has got a mission. We're, we're seeking and saving the lost. We're gonna be used by Jesus to be equipped in this place and to go out and be the hands and feet of Jesus. We're not gonna get distracted with offenses. We're gonna be the most unoffendable church in all of New York City because we know how God has saved us and done a new work in us. Not only that, but we are specifically focused on reaching those who are far from God. So it's not just about our house, not just about our culture. It's not just seeing, valuing, and believing in the people right here, but it's the same way when we leave this place. The same way. Acts chapter 11, I don't wanna go through the whole story and read it, but it's this powerful scripture where Peter He's gone to Judea and he's been with the Gentiles and they had received the word of God. And when he comes to Jerusalem, those who are circumcised believers, the, those who may have been Gentiles, but or I'm sorry, Jews, but now believe in Jesus, are like, how were you able to go and sit with these uncircumcised people? And so it goes on, the story goes on, and Peter, he tells them the story again because they said, you went into the house of the uncircumcised men and ate with them? And so then he tells them, well, here's what happened. I had a dream, and in this dream, there was like a sheet that came down and all of these different animals were there, and the Lord said, go ahead and eat. And Peter said, surely not, Lord. I'm not gonna eat because nothing unclean has ever, or impure has ever entered my mouth. But the voice spoke from heaven a second time and said, don't call anything impure that God has made clean. And so then this happened a couple of times and then there was this crazy encounter where men who had a vision from the Lord came and encountered with Peter, had an encounter with Peter and he told them about all of this that was going on. You can read it in Acts chapter 11. And as they began to speak and they were talking, the Holy Spirit came upon these Gentiles who shouldn't have been able traditionally to be able to come into relationship with Jesus the same way they believed that they were able to. And so what happens is God gave them the same gift of, of being filled with the Holy Spirit and of those who believed in the Lord Jesus. And so Peter responds to the believers. He says, so who am I to think that I could stand in God's way? When they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God saying, so then even to Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. What a cool story. Because what we actually see is most of Jesus's ministry was around a lot of people who would have been religious. That's why he so often talks to the religious leaders and the Pharisees, and he's always trying to have conversations with those who are discounting everything he's saying. But it's actually rare that Jesus encounters someone who's a Gentile, because a rabbi at that time wouldn't have even sat at a meal with Gentiles, though we see him do this, like the woman at the well and all kinds of beautiful stories. But what scripture is telling us is that the gospel is for everyone. The gospel is for everyone. And the hard work for you today is to ask yourself, who have I disqualified from the love of God? Because there's always someone Oh no, that's, that's not me. I would never do that. But, but there, let's be honest. Let's do the heart work today. Let's be honest with ourselves that there are people who've done us wrong who we've said, oh yeah, but not for them. Have I let offense 
stand in God's way? Have I been the offense that stood in the way of someone else receiving Jesus? And I love this idea for you and for me and for our house and for our church to say, you know what? We're gonna be a church. There's all kinds of churches in New York City and the country and beyond. But here in this house, we're gonna be a church that does not stand in the way of someone hearing about the message of Jesus. No, no, we're not gonna be the door and say, oh, I'm the door and, and my expectations, people have to rise to my expectations to come in this room and to love God and to hear the message of Jesus. That's not your job. Let me remind you, if the religious spirit has gotten into you, that is not your role. And guess what? It's not your role on social media either. It's not our role to say, oh no, you're disqualified. Oh, that person, they can't love God. They don't have access to God. They're not really saved. Stop talking like that. You're getting in the way of what God wants to do in someone's life. And we're just going to be a church that's going to say, you know what? We're going to get out of the way so that people can come in. It doesn't matter what you look like, how you talk. It doesn't matter what you smell like. You're welcome. It's called an open table where anyone can come and eat. God. We want to be a church who sees, values, believes in people. We want to be a church that makes a way for people to encounter Jesus rather than stands in the way. So today, if people are our heart, and we're doing the hard work of heart work, that's what we're going to do. But we're also going to live this truth that church isn't what we do, it's who we are. Church isn't what we do, it's who we are. Listen today, this is not an event that we attend. It is a community we belong to. It's a community we belong to. So you and I, we're gonna do life together. We're gonna do life together and I do wanna challenge you today. If you're still coming and not doing life with anyone, you've gotta ask yourself, am I, am I not allowing myself to be open and vulnerable? Is there, is there a group I could join? Is there a team I could serve on? Is there, is there someone I could connect with? God, I don't wanna stay in my own comfort zone. I want to be a part of the church because you can find a better show on Broadway if this is just an event. Although the singers won't be nearly as good as ours. Right? So what does it mean to do life together? It means that we're going to show up for the party even when we're tired even when it's inconvenient. You're gonna send a meal to the hospital while your friend's there for a procedure. You're gonna text that friend late at night before you go to bed who just had a baby and you're gonna say, I'm thinking of you, I'm praying for you. Do you need me to come over at 2 a.m. and watch the baby? Not kidding. I've lived it. And aren't you grateful for the community who shows up who shows up. It means asking a friend to go and get a coffee. It means getting on the phone throughout the week. Who knows if you've got 20 minutes or 30 minutes and just saying, hey, can I talk to you about a couple things going on? It means going on the double date. It means opening your home for the connect group. It means organizing the barbecue. It means sitting around the table and asking those around you what God is doing in their life. We're gonna do life together. And it's gotta be more than just what happens in the hour and 15 to 45 sometimes minutes. <laughs> it's gotta be more. And that's on us today. That's on us. The ball is in our court 
to say, you know what? It's on me. I'm gonna take responsibility for my part in the body of Christ. Sometimes the truth is, is that the enemy convinces us that we have nothing to offer. And that's why we stay within ourselves. Perhaps he's convinced you that you'll just get hurt again. And you know what? He's right. If you're a part of a church and you know people, you will get hurt because people are people. And the church is no different. We are people because we're not just an event, we're a community. My dad, he's pastored his whole life, my whole life, I guess, and he always tells me, he goes, if you wanna get hurt, join a church. What would, what, would you rather just get hurt at the club? You can go get hurt at a club. You can get hurt at your school. You can get hurt on the train. You can get hurt in the book club. You can get hurt online. It's all about people. The common denominator is you. It'd be easy if we weren't here. But man, it'd be boring. Lifeless, without testimony of the goodness of God. Thank God that we're here. Even when it's hot, we're gonna do life together. Even when we've got church fans, we're gonna do life together. And you know, I've had experiences in my life and I shared it with you before and I, I wanna always be honest when I share God's word and I wanna share from a real life experience if I can because sometimes I feel like, it, I don't know, sometimes it can feel like you think we're perfect or something and I want you to know we're really not. And, um, and I've had moments where people have totally broken my heart. I mean, as a pastor's kid, talk about church hurt. I mean, it's like a front row seat to watch people leave your life year after year after year. Best friends, people that you thought would be in your wedding. You know, it, when you're a part of community like this, it can be hard to be the one who stays. And who says, God, you've planted us here and we're not gonna leave until you tell us to go. I wish there was more of a culture of that in the church. And I think that that's the kind of culture that we're building here, is that God's called us. God's called us. So if God called you to this church, you gotta stay. You're like, but you're offending me right now. I love you, I'm sorry. I'm always out in the lobby, you can tell me. But I've had moments where I've said, God, can I just throw in the towel? It's just too heartbreaking. It's just too upsetting. God, people are just too much work. Lord, is it, can, is it worth it? Should I keep doing this, God? What have you called me to? Is this what it is? Is this what I've signed up for? Can I just throw in the towel on this relationship? And I felt the Lord speak to me, Kristen, sure, you can, you can throw in the towel right now on this side of eternity, but get ready because that's my child too. And so you're gonna know them forever. <laughs> and it was a challenge that the Lord gave me to get right with people as much as it depends on me. If it depends on me, God, I wanna be the kind of person who reaches out and says, hey, did I hurt you? Did I upset you? Something feels off. And if I don't do it, could you reach out to me? Hey, I felt kind of hurt. I wanna create a culture in our church that doesn't just get offended and walks out the door, but is reminded that we're a part of a family, the family of God. You don't just leave. You have a conversation. You try to work it out. You sit around the table. You share a meal together. You say, God, we are your people. And if people are our heart, we're reminded that eternity is within us. So you're not just offending a person for a moment, you're offending one of God's children that he has granted eternity to and you're gonna know them forever. Let's not make heaven awkward. Get it right here. We're gonna do life together. So the heart work is that we're gonna forgive. We're gonna forgive. We're gonna stay. We're gonna 
bless those who curse us. We're gonna comfort. We're gonna walk through highs and lows with each other. We're gonna pray together. We're gonna praise God together. The heart work is that in the valleys and on the mountaintops, we're not gonna be alone. We're gonna walk the journey together. Why can we do this? Because Jesus didn't give up on us. Jesus didn't give up on us so I can do the hard heart work of not giving up on his church. If he did the hard work on the cross, I can do the heart work of saying, God, I'm planting myself in your church because people are my heart. Amen? People are our heart. All over the room, we're going to pray a prayer real quick. You can shut yourself in with God. You can close your eyes, whatever you need to do. But if you're here today and you'd say, you know what? To be honest, I have been really struggling whether it's church hurt or community or feeling isolated, I wanna pray very specifically for those today who've got a wound in their heart. And I wanna ask God to start a healing process. Some of you, you've been walking with this wound for far too long. And today is the day that God's saying, I'm gonna close, close it up. I'm gonna bind it up. I'm gonna bind your wounds. And today you're gonna walk in healing. You're gonna walk in restoration. In Jesus' name, if that's you today and you need prayer, just lift your hand to heaven so I can see you. I see you, I see you. You've been hurt, you've got a wound. Maybe the church hurt you. Maybe there've been people, Christians who hurt you. You felt like you couldn't live up to expectations. I see you, I see you. Hands going up all over this room. You can put your hands down. Lord, right now, I pray for your sons and your daughters today who you love, God, so dearly. And I ask, Lord, that you would come right now and bring comfort to their hearts. For those, God, who've wanted to opt out and throw in the towel on all things church and people today, God, I pray that you would draw them back in and that you would start to do some heart surgery on their heart. Lord, you love them and you see the tears that they've cried. You've seen the moments that they were wronged. God, there was no moment of their life that you were unaware of or caught off guard by. And Lord, right now, we give every wound to you. We give every hurt to you. We place it at the foot of the cross and we ask God right now that as we surrender it, healing would come. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. All over the room, as you stand to your feet in just a moment, we're going to get up on our feet because I know it's warm. We're going to shake off the heat. We're going to get ready to worship. But if you're here today and you'd say, you know what? I know I'm not in right relationship with God. All over the room with eyes closed, heads bowed. If that's you and you say, I'm coming back. I'm making my life right with Jesus. I'm giving him my all again today. It's not just that church had hurt me. I felt like God had forgotten about me. And today, God, he's speaking straight to you and says, I see you, I love you, I believe in you, I've got purpose for you, come home. If you're here today and you need to come home to Jesus, I want you to lift your hand right now. Whether it's the first time or the first time in a long time, I see you, 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 amen, amen. We're gonna pray a prayer of salvation together and you can just pray it in your heart. Say, Lord, I give you my life. I give you everything I've gone through and I place it at your feet. I ask you, God, to forgive me. Come into my life and make me whole again. God, I give you all of me in exchange for all of you. I love you, Lord. I'm a new creation today and I believe that the best is ahead for me. In Jesus' name we pray.